This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. What we're seeing is what Tom Horn, when he called a bunch of his writers together and said, let's write one on blood on the article, because I see Christian coming after Christian. But what we expected is we, we, see, we, we see all these liberals that have the name of Jesus, but now they're against what the Word actually plainly says. That's what a lot of us were expecting, and that we see that war coming. That they're going to go after fundamental Christians that are conservative with those that claim to be of Jesus, but they're rewriting the Word or ignoring the Word completely. We expected that. But what we didn't expect is minor differences in our understanding of the Word result in all-out war. Now, are there problems in places in the body of Christ? I've got a long laundry list, guys. We have the charismatic movement that has gotten into new age and mysticism. We have the Baptist. I was raised Baptist, okay? There are too many Freemason pastors. There are too many in Freemasonry that hold the presidency or chancellorship of their seminaries. How many know that contaminates everything? We have the Hebraic Roots Movement has fallen off a cliff. I was talking with my good friend, Dr. John Gar, and in our conversation, I mean, I, I want to make a t-shirt out of this. He said, if you're doing Hebrew Roots correctly, it makes you a better Christian. If it doesn't, you're doing something wrong. And I thought, oh man, I, I want to... Oh, I said, well, say that again so I can write it down so I can trademark it before you get it trademarked, brother, you know. Because we're minor, we're majoring on the minors when what our Hebraic understanding and bringing it back into a proper balanced context within the New Testament is like giving you rocket fuel in your tank. If it's not then you've gone on. See, that's, that's why I think that the threat was to the devil, is if it's done right, it's done in balance. You add the foundation that a Baptist would have in the Word of God. You add the understanding of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and moving in the Spirit. And then you bring back our Hebraic understanding so that we get Babylon out and we begin operating in kingdom principles. Then you become a special forces agent in the kingdom of God. Instead of fighting over each other about, well, how do you tie your zitzi? If you're not Jewish, rich, you don't know clue what I'm talking about. He's got a zitzi? Yeah, I got a zitzi. Okay. How long is yours? How do you tie yours? Well, mine, mine has the special twist to it that looks like DNA. Well, mine doesn't. I do it the Ashkenazi way. Come on. 
And we see this constant bickering and biting. In fact, some ministries have done nothing but to make their major purpose to destroy another ministry. I thought it was supposed to be to proclaim the gospel. To teach people to walk with God. We have a lot of self-appointed apologists that do not have the anointing of an apologist to do it. Because an apologist will always stay in balance and stay in love. I've trained those that are called to the ministry of being an apologist. And you can see it in Josh McDowell, and you can see it in Walter Martin and others, past apologists, that while they're pointing out error, there's this, still this heart for them. We need to pray for them to lay these things down and come to Jesus. They're praying for their souls. But while we're sitting here attacking one another, barraging one another, praying against one another, doing spiritual warfare against one another. Now show me in the Word of God where it says that we're to conduct spiritual warfare against other believers. It'll be a long wait because it's not there. But what's the point of all that? We're not praying the prayers that we should be praying. We're not grieving over the evil that's in the land and the Christians that are dying and the families that are being destroyed and the kids that are that the sex trafficking, whether they're children or adults. Our hearts aren't grieving over that because brother so-and-so says we should use the King James only. Well, this guy over here is using the MEV. Wonder what they did before the King James came out. I was always blown away that those that made the original Ten Commandments, they went to an archaeological dig and they had discovered that when God spoke to Moses, thousands of years before Jesus came, that Almighty God said, Thou shalt not. No. I do want a good, accurate version. But when you start worshiping a version, whatever version, because it has wordage that you can use for your slant, then we're in trouble. I've even had them go as far as to say the king of the Greek and the Hebrew was not anointed, but the King James, and as they were translating it, God anointed them to make corrections to Moses and Jesus and Paul. Ay, ay, ay. I worship Jesus. Now, there are some translations out there I will not touch with a 10 foot pole. I mean, I look at them in that room and say, what on earth were you thinking? I've gone to colloquiums where I, I've got some friends that were actually on the committee for the NIV. And we, we jokingly tell them, well, you served on the nearly inerrant version translation. Because I, I got problems. With them, but the, I tell you what, there are some out there right now that make the NIV look like kindergarten errors compared to some that are being made today. But we can present truth. We need, to make, we need to stay focused on what God wants us to stay focused on, on the greater picture. If we bite and devour one another, we free up the enemy so that he can do everything that he wants to do in darkness. But only when we pray against it can it be broken and revealed. But we can't because we're too busy shooting one another. I've heard it said that the body of Christ is the only firing squad that all of them gather their guns and then form a circle. But I want to go on a little further here. Jesus said, would he find faith in the earth? In other words, we're going to become so frustrated. How many know when you, when you look in the context of how many Jewish people in Jesus' day accepted him compared to how many were alive at that time, it was a remnant. 
And even compared to the Gentile world, the, the Gentiles that became believers was a small group compared to everybody else. And so now Jesus is looking, am I going to find faith in the earth when I come back because of your frustration about things and getting in the flesh? Do you know what caused the first destruction of Jerusalem? When they got a zealot in that was a high priest that refused to offer a daily sacrifice for the health of Caesar. That's it. I would have offered a daily sacrifice not only for his health, but that he would come to the knowledge of God. And because of that, Look at all the damage that was done. Out of frustrating, they were, they were tired, of, tired of waiting. There was this Jesus coming, and we was expecting him to be my Messiah, Ben David. And when he wasn't, we just worked and worked our political things until we got a guy in there that we thought would try to do it. And then the rabbis have a history of either bringing in guys they thought were going to defeat the Romans and it happened again and again and again. One of them was actually named David, going to be like King David. He didn't survive the first battle. We have Simon bar Kochba that what they did caused the second destruction of, of, of Jerusalem. This time, they not only, they, they literally plowed it under and built a Gentile city over the top of it and said, if you're Jewish, it's illegal for you to be in this, in this area. And I'm not bashing the Jews. We're doing the same thing today. In so many different ways. This word in the Greek, pistis, means conviction of the truth of anything. But I, I like when I'm, I'm going down in, in some of the, the things that, uh, that the, this definition, a strong and welcome of conviction or belief that Jesus is Messiah, through whom we may obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God, but it also means fidelity, faithfulness. When you look up when the, when the Apostle Paul said, the just shall live by faith, he was quoting Habakkuk, and literally it should be written. When you go back to Habakkuk and you look in the Hebrew, it's the just shall live by his faithfulness to God. His fidelity to the covenant. They said, Jesus was saying, listen, when I come back, is there going to be fidelity to the king or are you going to build your own empires? Are you going to build your own mechanisms for vengeance that you believe that is owed you and you don't think that heaven is answering? That's scary, isn't it? When I looked this word up because I wanted to see its corresponding word in the Hebrew. Because even though Paul was writing, or Jesus was speaking. How many know they were thinking like Hebrews, even though Paul ended up writing in Greek? That's one of the reasons that he was a graduate of the school of Hillel, said under Gamaliel, that he could think like a Hebrew, yet articulate it in a way that a Greek would understand it. Highly qualified. So when I look at this and I look at the Hebrew comparison, Hebrew alignment with this word out of the Septuagint. Steadfastness, trustworthiness, faithfulness, honesty, staying true to official duty. Okay? Then you can go on down again, trustworthiness in agreement with royal command. Man, I looked at this and I thought, we're missing the point of what he's trying to say here. Let's listen to the English words that are translated from, that are equivalent to this, and the Septuagint. Trust, faithfulness, faith, honor, confidence, assurance, loyalty. One of the things about the remnant in the last days, they're going to be loyal to Jesus even over themselves. They will love not their lives unto death. There's always been a phrase out of Job that uh, has slapped me about the head many times in my life. Especially when I'm about ready to have a hissy fit. 
Anybody know what a hissy fit is? That's when you get in the flesh and you need to hide because you don't even want to see, have your wife see you have this hissy fit, okay? Because I don't understand. And nearly every single time God will bring up this verse out of Job. That here Job is and he's lost everything. And the first three comforters that he had weren't even hearing God. He had to offer up a sacrifice for them. The fourth one actually made sense. And I've heard speakers say that was the kid from YWAM finally showed up to break some balance. He was a young kid. But he said, even though he will slay me, I'll not deny him. I will still faithful to him no matter what. Why is that important? Because the only covenant that Job had with God was protection of his life. And he said, even if he takes away that part of the, the, my only promise, Job lived before Abraham. His only promise is, I'm not going to let these crazy people around you kill you. And so he said, even if God himself comes and violates that covenant and he kills me, I will die saying, I love you. I will be faithful to you no matter what. You see, there's, there's, so, there's well, at the same time, it's a conviction, but it's a holy anger. When I saw all the, the men in jumpsuits cut off the heads of the believers there by the, by the sea. And what's interesting is they were all like eight something. And then Syria accuses the U.S. of releasing super soldiers into the theater of combat. You kind of wonder who they are, where they came from. But the last thing that those people cried out before they gave their life was Jesus. They wanted to make sure that his name and their fidelity to him, their loyalty to him was the last thing that they had ever said in this life. Could that be said for Christians in America today? Or will our last words be, that doesn't line up with my theology. Pastor said. Or even worse, they could have been saved. All they had to do was renounce Jesus. How many believers in America? Now, believers are getting hurt feelings in renouncing Jesus in America. We get disillusioned by our own theology that we created to appease our flesh. And when it doesn't work, now we're questioning Jesus. Go back to the book. And they're questioning Jesus and walking away from the church. There's a motto of the U.S. Marine Corps. Semper Fi, always faithful. That needs to be the heart cry of every single believer. I'll be faithful. And I'm going to be faithful in following his instructions, whether I'm dealing with the devil, I'm dealing with me, or I'm dealing with you. That regardless of how angry or upset or riled up I am, I go back to the Word and I choose to corral my feelings to the Word so that I can be scriptural when I deal with things. So that if I need to crucify the flesh, I don't want to be after that little speck in your eye when I've got this log sticking out of mine because I'm offended. You know what I have found out with that log that can be sticking out our eyes? You can beat somebody to death with that thing. But when's the last time you've seen somebody beat to death with a splinter? God wants faithfulness. When Jesus returns, will he find believers that are still loyal to his royal commands? Or will they be off working their own carnal agendas, calling it ministry? We look at Hebrews chapter 7, 
starting in verse 22. Now, this is the superiority of the high priesthood of Jesus over that of man. How many know Jesus never had to offer a sin offering for his sin? You know, the high priest had to do that every day to make sure that he was covered so he could function. Not only that, you'd have a good one. He'd eventually die and grow old, die. And then some scallywag would get in that was high priest, and you'd have trouble for a while. You you can see that with the high priest. You can see that with the kings of Israel, both. And so one of the things that I believe Paul, who I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews personally, is saying, listen, we don't, have to, we don't mess with that with Jesus. The perfect life, he's never going to die. He is the high priest forever, and he's without sin. Starting verse 22, but so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there are many priests because they were uh, prevented by death from continuing, but because he continues forever and has an unchangeable priesthood, therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Now listen to this last part. Since he lives to make intercession for them. How many are glad that Jesus is praying for you right now? Not only is he praying for me, he's my defense attorney in the court of God. Hallelujah. But one of the the aspects of this that I think that we have forgotten is that sometimes Jesus wants to pray through his body. Do you know when your intercessory prayer, and you know, I've had times where I've had done intercessory prayer and it's like you're beating the air. Has anybody ever felt like that at times? And then all of a sudden you get to this spot and it's like this, you know, it's, it's like on those old Mad Max things where somebody hits the nitric oxide and the car goes like this and just, all of a sudden you hit power because the Holy Spirit led you to begin coming in line that what Jesus was praying in heaven and what you were praying on earth were the same thing. And you got in agreement with heaven. We can't do that in the flesh. We can't do that in our frustration. We can't do that by beating each other uh, to pieces. And you see, this only happens in places of wealth and affluence and safety. You get overseas where Christianity is the minority, nobody talks about denominations. That's what frustrated American organizations with the Chinese over there that you had Baptists that were embracing the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the Baptists say, you can't do that. And they say, if it's in the Word, where we're at, we need it. Some of them don't have an option to go to a doctor. It's either believe God, get healed, or die. And we're saying, well, that just doesn't line up with my doctrine. They're getting healed. In our affluence, we are like Laodicea. We think we have arrived and we're wealthy, we're we're well-dressed and all this, and Jesus said, you're naked, you're blind, you're filthy from one end to the other. But I tell you what, you can take a sinner and get them dressing just a certain way and speak in a certain way, and the church will clamor over them. Because affluence can mimic spirituality, but it's not real. We need to learn to be real because if we don't, what we're seeing overseas will come here. But if we will get our act together and flow with the kingdom, God can create a safe place for the gospel to continue being preached in these last days. Now, those that have ears to hear can sense that. Well, there have been those that have been prophesying for ages the demise of America because they were functioning at that time as a prophet or ending up like Jonah's because they're getting mad because Nineveh repented. And we need to make sure that we're not like that. We need to line up with heaven. Now, have we seen as much repentance as we need to see? No. But if the remnant will conduct themselves by kingdom protocols, it can bring others to repentance. 
The kingdom has manners. The Holy Spirit has manners. That when we conduct ourselves that way, then heaven begins to respond. When we pray that way, heaven responds. The last thing that we need is for our carnal, selfish prayers. Heaven won't hear, but hell will put the work because the enemy loves to take the prayers of someone who's supposed to be following Jesus to destroy the body with it. That's got to stop. Heaven demands more, and we need more than this hour. Father, I ask that you would just give us a supernatural grace, Father, to repent where we need to repent. Father, to lay down old axes that we've had and bury them at the foot of the cross and ask for you to heal and to restore us that we can line ourselves back up with heaven and do things the way that Jesus would do them even when our flesh doesn't want to. And Father, our heart's cry is that you would do that in this day and this hour to those that can hear your voice and be moved by your spirit. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering Heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant, and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken, be empowered, and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. Get your copy at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com that's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.